is the Zen moment <laughs> before the holidays oh. begin. <laughs> Hey, you're live. Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome everybody to the December library lecture. Uh, this is the World of Haystack Rock, and uh, the lecture series is sponsored by the Friends of Haystack Rock and the Cannon Beach Library. And just a reminder that the library series is the second Wednesday of every month from now through April. So we hope that both the folks online and the folks in the room will join us again for future sessions. Um, this evening, we have uh, an exciting speaker. It's Allison Anholt. And Allison is going to be talking about snowy plover monitoring on the northern Oregon coast. Now, um, some of you probably know Allison because she is the coastal community science biologist for the Portland Audubon. And in that capacity, she does a lot with community science monitoring. Um, Allison um, monitors coastal birds on Oregon's North Shore, including the Western Snowy Plover, Black Oyster Catcher, one of my favorites, and other local <laughs> seabirds. And before coming here uh, and monitoring um, for Portland Audubon, she worked in wildlife conservation in the Aleutian Islands, Mississippi Gulf Coast, the Florida Everglades, and Cape May, where I just found out she spent a lot of time monitoring horseshoe crabs, one of my favorite <laughs> sea creatures. Um, but we're thrilled to have her this evening talking about snowy plovers. Um, before I turn it over to Allison, I just want to, again, thank you all for coming this evening. I want to thank the library for their sponsorship. And I just want to remind everyone that this library series is honor in honor of our good friend and partner and um, uh, energetic um, advocate, Sandy Lundy, who passed this last year. So um, thank you for joining us, Allison. Welcome. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you for the intro. Yeah, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about Portland Audubon's Community Science Monitoring Program for Snowy Plovers, which is called the Plover Patrol Program and was based here on the North Coast. And I just want to point out before we get started, this is a multi-partner project. We work with several different organizations to get this going. It's not just Portland Audubon or our volunteers. It's also we work with Oregon State Parks and Recreation, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and also with Portland State University and their Institute for Natural Resources. So first of all, these are these cute snowy plovers. Anyone here seen one before? They're, tiny, they're small little birds, they're the size of sparrows, and they blend in really well. They're, they're, they're superpowers, they blend in really well with the sand. So um, they, they're really hard to see, even when they're out there, um, they're difficult to see. Uh, they range across, as you might imagine, sandy beaches throughout uh, Oregon, Washington, California, and even down to Mexico. Um, and they have a population, a couple other populations inland and on the Gulf Coast that are different birds, so they don't come to the Oregon coast. So these are the western snowy plovers we'll be talking about today, but there are snowy plovers in the inland, inland saline lakes, like the Great Salt Lake area, um, as well as on the Gulf Coast. So here's their, their range map. You can see all the different populations as well. And it's important to note the plovers really inhabit just a section of the beach. So they only are on sandy beaches. And even then, they're only on a section of it um, in this kind of high tide line area. I like to say that plovers, you can tell them apart from other shorebirds, they don't like to get their toes wet. <laughs> um, so they don't love that area where it's super wet <laughs> down, down by the, the wave line. They prefer the damp sand. And then all of their nesting takes place above the mean high tide line and the dune line. So it's just this very narrow stretch of beach where they can inhabit um, the, the, this, this area. So this is a really keystone species for this particular region. And how do you tell them apart from other birds? So there's a couple different defining features. One, they have a really short bill, so they don't have those long bills that probe into mud for insects. They more um, catch insects, particularly those sand fleas you see jumping around in the rack line. That's their favorite thing. They have a neck collar. That's really important. A way to tell them apart is they have that black neck band. The males have more than uh, a darker one than females. Um, they also have a, a, a spot behind their eye and also a black spot on their forehead. Again, both the males and females um, have that as well. A good way to tell a plover apart from other shorebirds is if their bills are shorter than their heads, um, as opposed to like ones with really long bills like that. 
And then often um, they have these color bands that we see here on their legs that help mark them as individuals. They're banded when they're chicks or when they're adults and each one has a unique color band and that can be pulled apart from others. So if you find one with a color band, you can tell its entire life history by looking it up in the database. <laughs> Um, this is just a difference between males and females. Uh, again, there's the male with his darker markings on his face, and you can tell the females apart during the breeding season. Um, they lose that black plumage during the winter time. So right now, if you saw clover, you couldn't tell if it was male or female or a young of year, um, a chick from the past summer. So, but here you can see the female looks much more, even more blending into the sand than the male does. And that's because she incubates mostly during the day. Um, so she needs to be even more cryptic and sand colored to hide from predators. So we'll talk about this in cross uh, more in sequence, but the plover timeline, they're here on our Oregon beaches year round. They don't leave, they don't go anywhere. Some of them may go down to Southern California or they might range even up to Washington or go to different beaches in Oregon, but by and large, they don't migrate south um, like a lot of other birds do. So their breeding season starts in about mid-March um, and their non-breeding season begins in about mid-September. So let's talk about these in turn. So first, the first thing they do and when we start in this mid-March cycle is they begin egg laying. So here in the middle of this, oh, there's a pointer. Oh, right there, perfect. Um, on this pointer right here, there's, a, there's one egg. Um, and so they begin their egg laying season um, in the middle of March and they put their eggs in a, what's called a scrape. It's just a little divot in the sand, basically. The male kicks out um, the sand to create a little tiny divot in the ground. Um, and the female chooses which one. So sometimes you might build about 15 of those before she chooses the yeah. right location. Um, and so that's how, how they choose that. And then you can find them from there on out, they kind of scrape a road because it's sand, right? But um, it, you can find them again by looking for all these little clover tracks you can see around by that day. Turn my pointer off. And after that, they uh, finish laying about three days later. Um, and what's called full clutch is three eggs. So they lay three total eggs, generally speaking, sometimes less, occasionally more. We found one poor egg nest this year. Um, but generally speaking, they lay three eggs and it takes them about a day and a half between. And then from there, they incubate for 35 days. Um, the female does almost all the daytime incubation. So again, she looks even more cryptic than the male for that reason. And the male takes the nighttime shift. Um, he gives her an occasional lunch break too. So sometimes you can, if you're really lucky, you can spot the male incubating during the day, but by and large, that's their schedule. And then uh, after 35 days, uh, the eggs hatch and the parents will take away the eggshell from, uh, from this area. They, they, it takes a little bit of time for them to hatch for all three eggs. Um, they don't incubate the eggs in the first three days. They wait for those three days and then they'll incubate them all together. So they hatch at around the same time. So they don't have different cooking times, right? Um, Cause it's really hard to kind of keep track of two running around chicks while the other is still in the, in the egg. So they hatch pretty much all at once but that usually takes about 12 hours. So in that time frame, they'll take away that eggshell which attracts scents um, from other predators and things like that as well. So sometimes if you get really lucky, you can catch a photo like this, um, which one of our beach goers on Seaside caught this year or you can uh, see them actually taking away the eggshell. And there's a super wet chick on the ground, it takes a little bit to dry off. So again, mostly synchronously. This one, the male is brooding. You can see uh, he's got his, his shoulders dropped down like that. That's a sign that he's got chicks underneath there. And this other one uh, decided he didn't want to be there, I guess. So. Um, so they start running around within a couple hours. This is really unusual. If you think of something like a robin um, where their chicks are, are naked um, and they are completely dependent, their eyes aren't even open and they're totally dependent on their parents immediately um, and need to stay in the nest until they grow all those flight feathers, right? Um, these birds live out in the open sand. And so it's more important for them to be able to run away from predators right away. In addition, having chicks is a bigger investment than having eggs. And so therefore it makes more sense for them to uh, lay those eggs and keep incubating them for a long time. So like 35 days as compared to like 12 days for a robin. Um, and so by doing that, their chicks become, when they come out, they're more developed than like a robin chicks would be. So that's this ornithological term it's called precocial versus altricial is the name for robins when they do that and other birds like that. So this means that they can get up and they can run around within hours, within just a couple hours. Um, and so the dad has got his work cut out for him after that, um, trying to wrangle three chicks. They stay pretty close and obviously there is parental care. The adult male will stay with them um, throughout their chick rearing period and it takes about 28 days to fledge or become capable of sustained free flight. So to grow those flight feathers. And so they start out these 
little tiny fuzzy things like you see there. And by fledge time, they can become pretty difficult to tell apart from an adult female bird. Right. So, um, so they, and they, they can see they start hunting and the parents teach them how to hunt, specifically the male will teach them how to hunt. Um, the female will usually go off and try to start another nest. So that's what happens. Her, her investment, she does more of those daytime hour incubation shifts and her um, hot time is basically done when the nest hatches and she goes and tries to lay another nest to sustain the population in the future. So the male does all the chick rearing. In about August and September, the adults start to molt their feathers and so they start to lose those dark markings on their face. Um, and they become a little bit harder to tell apart from fledglings. And you can see here, they've got this really patchy color to the back of their, their feathers. Their feathers just become really aged and things like that. So they start to grow new feathers by molting and they start forming loose migratory flocks. Um, and they're not, they're not really migratory, but they'll go around to different inlets and things like that. So sometimes you can spot as many as 30, 40 plovers in one spot um, starting in about August and September. In the meantime, in August and September, this one's a fledged chick. Uh, can be really hard to tell apart. Their heads look really speckly and they have this scallop look on their feathers, uh, but they do the same thing. They start to wander around and start looking for the next, the place where they want to nest next year. It's not necessarily the same beach where they're born on. And so they kind of do this uh, little tour of, of resident beaches to see where they want to nest the following year. So plovers, uh, yeah. Is there really some way to conclude that that's why they're doing it? They're scouting for a nesting place. Um, that's a good question. I think it's it's just I'm not sure if there's been like an actual study on that or not. We do know this from banding studies that they move around to different locations, mm -hmm. and we do also know that um, sometimes then they'll then show up to that spot next year. So like mm -hmm. it was born on um, Astoria and and a clats of spit up in the Warrington area, and then it might go down to the seaside area. It might be found there next year nesting. So, um, yeah, that's the commonly accepted wisdom, but I don't know the science to back it up. So that's a good, good question. Um, so plovers face a number of threats on our, on our local beaches. Um, it's not all hunky dory in the open sand. Life can be pretty hard. And so we've categorized these in three different ways. One is disturbance. And so you can see, uh, from this one here, then this circle, that, that oops, too far. This is a tire track right here. So tires can be a major issue. Oregon has a big culture of beach driving. Um, and you know, you can't really see these eggs in the sand. They're about this big and they are the color of sand on purpose. And so they become really difficult for humans um, to see. So disturbance impacts by humans is one of the major causes. Uh, predators are another. So that's a Northern Harrier picture there on the right-hand side. And the most complex one is habitat reduction. So this European beach grass, which I think we might all be familiar with, even if you didn't know it's called that, when you go up over the dunes, um, most of the grass that's growing in those really dense patches and create those big cliff structures of dunes is European beach grass. Um, European beach grass grows and forms those huge dunes. Plovers depend on their crypsis, on their ability to blend in with the sand, and also on their ability to look around and see predators come in. Crypsis on their ability to blend in with the sand. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so when that happens, it means that they can't, if they're in those dense stands of grass, they can't see anything around them. There could be a coyote one foot away and they wouldn't have necessarily be able to see it. So they will not nest in areas with really dense dune grass like that. In addition, it creates the ability, they couldn't run those chicks down to the tide line to be able to feed and things like that. So wherever European beach grass exists, Plovers have a really hard time making a go of it. And so when uh, European beach grass was planted intentionally to have flood control structures um, for our beaches, and it did a really great job at that, but in doing so, it reduced and eliminated habitat for snowy plovers. So because of all of those factors, um, there's a population crash of snowy plovers in the last century. Um, the population estimate was only about 50 individuals in 1990, and that's in all of Oregon. Um, by 2003, plovers are only recorded on a, just a few sites in Oregon, all, and they're all down in those southern Oregon areas with lots of sand, um, lots of really isolated spots, um, picture like the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area spots and things like that, where there's less people, less of that European beach grass, um, or isolated areas. And range-wide, they're having issues too, so also in Washington, California, and Mexico, um, range-wide, they're facing declines of uh, an estimate of up to 65%, so a really serious population decline. And so because of that, they're listed um, under the Endangered Species Act, both federally and for the state of Oregon. So they're listed federally in 1975, um, or listed as threatened in Oregon in 1975 and listed under federally in 1993. 
Um, because of that, it conferred additional protections for plovers, which we'll talk about next. Um, and there's uh, the outline goals for population recovery, um, specific management actions within and throughout Oregon. So because we we're able to list them underneath the Endangered Species Act um, in Oregon and federally, we're able to give them these additional protections. It also dictated specific actions, such as creating these plover management areas, um, having more effort for habitat restoration or creation of plover habitat and predator management as well. So you can see the sign here, you might, that might look familiar to you if you've been out on some of our North Coast beaches in the last few years. Um, so these snowy plover management areas are those areas where additional recreation restrictions are in place. And so these are the, the map of them across Oregon. Um, today I'll be focused mostly just on our North Coast sites, which is uh, from Clatsop Spit in the north on the Columbia River mouth. Um, and then five different sites uh, to all the way down to the South Sand Lakes bit, which is also known as Sitka Sedge Natural uh, Recreation Area, Natural Area, and that's just north of Pacific City. Um, we also have sites on the Halem Spit and Bay Ocean and Neatart Spit as well. So on these snowy plover management areas, um, there's a, a higher management level of protection. So that means that there's lots of recreation restrictions, which are outlined there. And it basically means people have to stay on the wet sand. Uh, that's the easiest way of describing it. So because those eggs are right on the dry sand and they can be anywhere and people don't know how to look for them or find them. And even people who do know how to look for them find them have a really hard time finding them. Um, it basically, uh, people are restricted from being uh, anywhere in the dry sand on the snowy plover recreation areas. And in addition to that, there's no dogs allowed because dogs really mimic their natural predators of coyotes and plovers can't tell the difference. Um, and so and there's also same similarly, there's no motorized vehicles allowed because those chicks could be down in the tide line um, and that causes issues. So motorized vehicles, including bicycles as well. Um, so five of these plover management areas are managed by Oregon State Parks and Recreation, which is who we partner with for this program. So the site selection process to find the snowy plover management areas in the state of Oregon was uh, done in a couple different ways. Plovers really love river inlets. They love this, look at this highly dynamic system. This is that Sitka Sedge State Natural Area down by Pacific City. Um, this is an unhardened inlet, which means it doesn't have any jetties on it or anything like that. And so you can see the sand loves to shift back and forth every, all the time. Every single winter, every time you go out there, it looks different. This is really great because it naturally keeps down that European beach grass um, and it creates this really great plover habitat with this really open expanse of sand where they can nest pretty much anywhere where there's high and high enough tide and they won't get flooded out. So plovers really love these areas, these river inlets in particular, and they sand spits. Um, so snowy plover management areas were designed in order to make use of that. Um, they also selected them based on a couple of reasons, uh, you know, that aren't related to the biology of the species, but also related to um, the, the beaches that could tolerate a high number of plovers and don't have a ton of people was a big part of it as well. So um, there's agreements between municipalities, Oregon State Parks and Recreation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife to have these snowy plover management areas that were designated back in 2007. Um, there are some rogue plovers though. Plovers don't listen to state management guidelines or where they should be nesting, where we think they want to nest. One example of this is here. This is Seaside. This is the inlet at Seaside Mechanicum Inlet. Um, really great. If I were to design plover habitat, I would make it look like Mechanicum Inlet. But there's tons and tons of people that live right there. So there's an obvious potential um, conflict that goes into, into effect. So if a nest is found on a non-snowy plover management area, Oregon State Parks and Recreation puts up a yellow rope around the nest itself of about 50 feet in diameter. So a pretty decent sized rope, but there are no additional recreation protections. So people can have dogs. They just can't go into the rope barrier itself. So, you know, there's lots of dogs, lots of people. I found a nest out there that had fireworks um, smoldering right next to it and things like that. Um, so, you know, they don't get any additional protections on those areas. And, um, but people are not allowed to enter that fenced and roped area. So that's kind of the, the conservation challenge with, these, with this species as we start seeing them more into the North Coast like we are now. And these recovery actions, speaking of that, have really worked. They've done um, really wonderful things for the snowy plover population. Um, there are now over 600 breeding plovers in Oregon, which is an incredibly high number um, and really great um, to see that recovery. And because of that, you know, they started out in that very southern area of Oregon where there's not that many plovers um, left. 
and they're all down in those isolated beaches. And now in very recent years, and I'm saying as recently as 2015, um, there's been plovers sighted in the North Coast. That was the first nest found in, in decades on the North Coast was in 2015. And since then, I'll talk more about this, but since then our numbers have really exploded in the North Coast every year. It's, a, it's an exponential increase and that's a really incredible thing to, to witness. So um, with that, there's a need to then monitor what's happening with the plovers on the North Coast in accordance with those um, regulations of the Federal Endangered Species Act and mandate to understand what's happening with them. And so with that, the Plover Patrol Program was started in 2018 to help serve that need. So the, our monitoring goals for the Plover Patrol Program with Portland Audubon. So we go into each of these snowy plover management areas on the North Coast, so these five that are up here on, on, between Astoria and uh, Pacific City. And so each one, we want to find and document every single plover. So every single one of these birds is <laughs> the color of sand and really small. Um, we want to record their bands so we can understand how and when individual birds are moving into the North Coast, how long they're staying, and how well they do, how, how uh, successful their nests are. Um, we want to find every single nest as well. So the nest can just look like that or like the picture I showed you earlier um, across <clears throat> all of these beaches. And so one way up here in the upper right hand corner, um, how we find them is by their tracks are very distinctive. They have two toes that go one way and one that goes like that, like pigeon toes, as opposed to a shorebird, which might uh, another type of shorebird, which might have their equal toes um, like that. So one way we do it is by following their tracks. They're a lot easier to find their tracks than are the birds themselves sometimes. And so when we do find their nest, we want to monitor exactly what happens to that nest. We want to monitor to fate, which is until it fails for some reason. And if we, uh, it does fail, we want to try to figure out why if we can, um, or more hopefully until hatching. Um, and if it, then we find it in a hatch, then we want to try to find that male and their chicks and follow their chicks around until they fledge. So we want to do all of this, all of this activity is very invasive kind of activity we to walk up and approach their nest without harming the birds unnecessarily. So there's a lot of rules and regulations that we use in order to do this ethically um, without disturbing um, or harming the birds we're supposed to be trying to protect. And you know what, this is really hard. So can anyone see, guess how many plovers are in this photo? You can see three. You can see three? Four. 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 All right. Let's see. So there actually are four. There's one in the back there too. Keep forgetting to do this. There's one right there as well. Right there. Pointer thing is. Yeah. Right there. However, this plover here is a plover, but it's the wrong species. So <laughs> just to make life harder, there's another species of plover out there that kind of looks like this. Um, this is a semi-palmated plover. It's the lower, the lower picture there um, as well. Uh, and it's it's similar. It has a full neck collar instead, and its back is more chocolatey colored rather than sandy colored. So these distinctions <laughs> are what make a difference. Fortunately for us, uh, semi-pollinated plovers do go up to the Arctic to nest. They nest in the Arctic tundra um, so that we don't see them past about June. But occasionally one sticks around long enough just to mess you up when you're looking trying to count plovers. So. Um, and so it's, it's also really hard to find other things as well. So there's a nest in this photo. It's right there. Wow. If you zoom in, it looks like that. So there's a, you know, they're they're really difficult, and that's kind of what it looks like when you're walking along. These nests are very small. You're tall, and even if you're looking straight down at it, it's pretty hard to see. So it's a difficult task to ask volunteers to do, or to ask anyone to do, really. And it can be really difficult just to be able to talk to the public about the challenges the plovers face. So here's some dogs in this photo. There's also plovers in this photo. So this is a, the dad plover is flying away, which is something they rarely do because when they're flying, they're more obvious in the air. So plovers during the breeding season very rarely fly around, they more walk around. Um, but it, it flies when it's super upset or disturbed or trying to distract these dogs or get its chick away. That chick down there, this was, it was literally born earlier that day when this picture was taken. So. Um, yeah, so that this is a challenge that, that plovers face, and one of our main goals of our program is to be able to talk to people about these challenges as well. Um, and again, we want to do all of this without harming the birds. So how do we do this? We have to have legal permits in order to monitor the birds. So we have a federal endangered species monitoring permit that each volunteer is required to be listed under. Um, so this is a really a high, a heavy lift. Like we have to ask them to do a lot in order to maintain this permit status. And we have to coordinate and approve each volunteer being able to be on the area. So you might imagine this takes a lot of training um, with 
Oregon State Parks and Recreation and US Fish and Wildlife um, in order to maintain and keep it. And then also we have to have constant in-season communication. We need to be able to communicate to each other. At this site, there's seven nests and this nest is doing this and this nest is doing this and you're going out there on Tuesday. And so you need to know that this nest is scheduled to hatch there. There's constant communication that goes along with this. So the volunteers, um, well, they'll start out doing an in, uh, in virtual or in-person classroom training um, where we give them a full like lecture on plovers as well as what it kind of looks like to be out there and why it's so important that they're underneath this endangered species permit as well. And then they go out for an initial field training. Um, volunteers and they'll do that with me to in order to see what it looks like on the ground. After that, if they still want to be a volunteer, um, then we place them into a track, which is either a nest monitors or wet sand volunteer. So a nest monitor are those ones that have the constant in season communication. We ask them to go out at least once every couple of weeks, if not more often, um, be subject to lots of chain emails and things like that, and email threads. Um, and be able, they're the ones that are going into the dry sand and are at risk of disturbing these nests and are also finding and monitoring these nests. Wet sand volunteers is another track that volunteers can do and that's a little bit easier. That's going out or it's not, it's very challenging in its own way, but it doesn't require an intensive permit process or time commitment. Uh, they're able to go out on the wet sand and so stay in the area where there won't be any nests, but still be able to count in those birds and record band sites. Um, and try to figure out what birds are on the site and when. Um, so that's a that's another fun challenge that volunteers do as well. Um, nest monitors in particular are placed with more experienced volunteers. So we have an informal uh, mentoring program as well, and they're placed on the federal endangered species permit. Um, we also have a smartphone data collection app. So we use smartphones to collect all this data and to help improve that in-season communication. We have maps that we follow where all the nests are and the status of each individual nest. So the red here means failed, the yellow is a uh, laying, or is, is uh, incubation stage and the black is hatched. Um, so we submit data, we have them literally do it on their cell phones or go home and submit data on the same day so everyone can be on the same page every time we go out. So the program results we've had this year, um, really incredibly our program has grown each year um, since 2018 when we started it. So since 2018, we've conducted over 500 surveys at six different North Coast sites. So some of these are the snowy plover management areas and some of them are areas where rogue plovers are. Um, we've had hundreds of outreach interactions. That's a really important aspect of the program, I think, is being able to communicate with people on the ground as members of the community, um, you know, what's happening with the plovers and why this happened. Because if you might imagine, this has just started nesting really since 2015 or later. And so people haven't had time to adjust to understanding that plovers are using their beaches and growing in number each year. So it's a, it's a constant um, opportunity to talk to people about plovers. Um, and in that time frame, we've also monitored 124 nests. So, and we're growing every year on that as well. So just uh, here's how we did this year specifically. So in total this year, we had 43 nests. So we've had you know, that many in total and 43 of them were this year, which is really incredible. Um, of those 43 nests, we hatched 13, which sounds bad, but it's not <laughs> for this species. Plovers depend on um, being old, like basically having several nest attempts per year and also being fairly long lived. So they live for a, about 10 years or more. And in that time, they just need to replace themselves plus one to grow the population, right? So in that time, you might imagine how many nest attempts it might take and how many fail because of those issues like predators or human disturbance and things like that, naturally. Um, so a lot of them, so we had 13 in the hatch, which is really great for us. And of that, we fledged 19 chicks, which is a really incredible um, fledging rate and also way more than any other year. So our other best year was 2018, where we fledged eight chicks. In this year, we fledged. We have more fledged than hatched. Uh, those are nests that hatch. So 13 nests hatched, they have three eggs. Oh, each. yeah. Ah. Good question. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, so we did really, really great. Um, our more, our sites with the most birds on them were on um, Clats of Spit and Bay Ocean down in Tillamook County. So Clats of Spit on the Columbia River and Bay Ocean down in Tillamook County as well. Um, we also record predators, another one we're out there. We have volunteers record both what's happening with the birds as well as potential clover uh, egg or adult or chick predators as well. So these aren't predators that we saw actually in, in interfering with the birds or taking bird nests. These are just the ones that we saw that were out there to try to get a measure of how what the issues are and how they vary by site. So we see, for example, on the North Coast, we see lots and lots more crows, American crows out on beaches, which are um, can be plover predators. 
down on the south coast, one of their biggest issues are ravens. Um, and we see the exact opposite impact here. So that's better because ravens are really, really smart. Crows are very smart. Ravens are incredibly smart. So we want the dumber ones, basically. <laughs> We're having them interactive with plovers. What you've got listed there is called corvid, is other corvids. Uh, no, so that's when people that didn't necessarily couldn't tell if it was oh, a crow or a raven. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, and then same, we have, you know, raptor species where people didn't write down what raptor it was, but we also know we had lots of um, peregrine, a few peregrine falcons, northern harriers can be plover predators as well. Um, also recorded cooper's hawks, bald eagles, and kestrels as well. So we record uh, this information when we go out there as well, and it's really important information to understand what the site dynamics of each area are on plovers. We also record, um, violations is what we call them, but it's basically when people are not following the rules of the snowy plover management area, um, recreation restrictions, we record when we see it. And if we have the opportunity to talk to them about it in a nice non-confrontational way, we'll do that as well. But at least we uh, record violations and also work and tell the Oregon State Parks and Recreation Park Rangers about it to give them information and up-to-date timely information. So we can uh, come up with charts that tell us, and we did that this year, that told us when the most violations were, right? Are they weekends or weekdays? Are they days when it's nice out, when it's not nice out? And this helps to, um, them to help target their, their ranger patrols as well. So at three of these different sites, um, we recorded all of these uh, violations here. And these are ones that have active rangers on duty as well. Um, and so you can see that dogs at, at each site, there's different issues. Um, and so at, at each site though, dogs are a pretty big issue. <laughs> dogs on or off leash in the area um, can be a challenge. People walking through that are just uh, either walking into the dry sand or through the nesting area itself um, are also a challenge as well. And then vehicles, you know, so a class of spit, you can see it's almost half of our violations, but it's only 4% down in the Halon. So it just, uh, it, it varies by site. And so it's good for us to know that. And it's really important information for Oregon State Parks and Recreation too. Um, and then, you know, one of the other things we monitor finally is just we record bands and that helps us to tell a story and to understand what the birds are doing. So this is an example from last year, but still, um, and this is, so this bird here, is white line white black is what we call them. Very aptly named, we call them the, what their bands are. So here you can see it's white line white on the left leg and black on the right. Um, she's a female and she was paired with red violet orange, which is down there on the right hand side. Um, this pair was at Nahalem for the entire season at the same site. So they stay, they really stuck around. They were recorded on, on every single survey we did that year. Um, so we saw them all the time. Um, and each nest was less than one mile from the last. Um, and they finally, they, after three nest attempts, they finally succeeded of hatching and raising one chick. Um, so they were just our local Halem residents last year. When do the birds get banded? They get banded either as chicks um, or as adults. You can capture them on the nest as well. Yeah, but mostly as chicks, that's most of the effort. Um, and then this one, uh, instead, this one uh, was very, very different. It did not stick around one site all this time. This one is aqua red violet, and this is a male. So we recorded it at the end of March, at the very beginning of the breeding season at the Halen Bay State Park. And we recorded that it had a nesting attempt and, and so it had laid a nest. Um, that nest failed and it was last recorded there from by us on the 21st of May. And then it went all the way down to Yahat. So that's 92 miles away um, by the end of June. <laughs> and then it began to hatch on in July. So, you know, it took about one month to hatch. Um, however, it began to hatch on the 723 on, on July 23rd. Um, and then on the 24th, the monitors down there reported that the new fire pit was dug about 35 feet from the hatching nest. They went out the next morning, they're like, somebody had a fire, a recreational fire here, and never saw the chicks again and saw the male upset. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some of these stories are good and some are bad, but it helps us, really gives us some really good information um, on what happens to these birds, what kind of threats they face, and how they may move around to these sites accordingly based on these threats. Um, this male came back this year, actually, in fledged chicks. So that is always good, too. Um, and then finally, we also do really interesting. We can record um, uh, different changes in the beach as well. We're also the eyes on the ground for the beaches. So here's one of our sites, Sick Sedge. Um, this is just what it looked like between 2017 and 2021. This year, it's changed yet again. Um, so these are where all these plovers nested here on the right hand side last year um, and then it's changes every single time we go out there and so we're able to 
use our GPS units to keep track of these changes on the beach as well. Yeah. What's happening to the north to the north of the estuary there? Is that like a uh, managed dune grass there? And why is it? Is that is um, Sand Lake Recreation Area. So that's a forest service land and it's an ATV area. So mm -hmm. it's a very popular. So there's a campground there. Um, so it's like right here. Yeah, so they're protecting the campground. And then are they restoring all campground, to the yeah. north? Is there that straight line? They're not restoring to the north. Yeah, this was um this is all like a very a natural inlet. You mean oh so this is yeah, they're there this is an ATV area where there's um there's so they, they cut into the dunes to have this ATV area, I think. Yeah, that spot. So that's what's going on, that straight line there. Yeah. There is a restoration project we just did this year on the south end to protect and add plover management area habitat. So the south end is a snowy plover management area, the north end is not. And so even though there are birds on the same inlet at each survey, we'd see them on one side, we'd see them on the other side, the next day, the same exact birds. So they're, they don't care, they don't care that up north is a campground and an ATV spot and down south is a nice protected area for them and all those other things. So, um, so it's really interesting watching them go to and from each site, uh, the management, you know, can really change and really affect how plovers do. So it benefits both of us for a service which manages the North End and Oregon State Parks and Recreation to have the plovers on the safe side. So that's why we chose to, you know, uh, add a restoration area and, and to take down some of that dune grass and create more nesting habitat here as well. Um, and it was also, you know, mostly done by our observations on the site, uh, on the ground to see where they would want to be and how we can help them in the site too. So I think there's just a couple uh, advantages and, and disadvantages I want to talk about with the volunteer model. And advantages are that volunteers are often local. I say it again, I think a really, a really, really impactful part of the program is the fact that these volunteers wear these hats. People ask them what they're looking at and they're able to talk to them about what's happening with the plovers out there and provide um, really organic conversations about what they can do out in their communities. Um, those who do make it through the intensive training, which it is intensive, um, are deeply passionate about the topic and are really excellent at monitoring these birds and understanding these changes and really taking it under their wing. Um, it allows far more coverage than I'd be able to cover. This is 75 miles of coastline is this area. So even if I was out every day, I wouldn't be able to get the coverage that our volunteers do. Um, and I think, yeah, again, acting as beach ambassadors and also as leaders in their local community. So we know that some of our volunteers have gone to community meetings and talked to people about um, trying to add more signage to tell people about the dog restrictions and things like that. Um, so that's a really important use of the program as well. So the future of the program, we're continuing on. Um, as the plovers grow, so do we, and so we will. Um, we want to continue improving our data quality and consistency, so that's a major focus of the program. We want to expand research. Why are these plovers choosing to nest on the north coast? Why are they coming back um, to their historic nesting habitat, and how are they doing here compared to where they've had success down in the south end, where they've done a lot more intensive management for a longer time? Um, so we're just kind of at this really exciting um, cusp of seeing this return uh, to their historic areas. We want to capture that. I want to focus more on talking to people in the communities um, about plovers, why it matters, and focus more on outreach opportunities, um, be able to create more tracks for volunteers to get involved, even if they can't go out and do nest monitoring, how can they be involved and help plovers in our area, and more efficiently connect that data with management decisions. So being able to really use our data collection as a force for creating better management actions for plovers as well. All right, so um, yeah, so anyone have any questions, it, you, there's also put my email up there if you want to email me, and we also have a website about it as well. If you'd like to come out and look for Plovers yourself, you're always welcome to give me a call, pick you out and see Plovers yourself. Yeah, Allison, amazing results. So um, uh, congratulations. How do the results that you're seeing on the Oregon coast, the North Coast, compare with other areas outside of Oregon, um, both in terms of practice and in terms of results? Yeah, so um, our results are really great this year, um, and they are comparable to how plovers are doing in areas where they're more intense. And there's a couple of really interesting potential reasons for that. One is that our predators might not know yet that there's plovers up here. <laughs> we might not have as many challenges um, as they are. Uh, so, you know, that could be one possible explanation. Um, the other is that these snowy plover management areas are, are working everywhere we put them out, um, that it's a great management strategy. Um, they are doing less well in Washington, and California is such a huge area that there's some sites that are super productive for plovers and some sites that aren't as much as productive. 
snowy plovers across everywhere where they exist. Um, so in the interior population as well as on the Gulf Coast have the same conservation um, status. They're both federally and state threatened everywhere they are, um, but they face very different issues. So if you might imagine the inland saline lakes area, um, their, their issues are not necessarily people. Some of those lakes are super isolated and things like that, but there's more water drying up their food supply in those areas and drought conditions are causing plover challenges. So they face very different issues out where they are. Our plover patrol program itself is super unique. Um, there's almost none like it. I just went to a national scientific conference and presented about our plover patrol like, volunteer program and had a lot of interest in, um, in doing it. So piping plovers out on the East Coast is an intensively monitored species. Um, and there are almost no volunteer run community programs um, for, for monitoring plovers because it is so difficult to find nests, to find chicks, to monitor what's happening. So it really speaks to the dedication of our volunteers out here. Yeah. Yeah. So who is, who is monitoring on the Central Coast and the South Coast? Yeah, good question. So the South Coast is um, that Oregon, it's our Institute for um, they also are known as Orvic. So they are with Portland State University and they have paid biologists, um, four of them down there. So two, two teams on like the Florence area coast and two teams down in Coos and Curry County as well. Um, the central coast doesn't have any snowy plover management areas that are designated. So they're all, all the plovers there are rogue plovers <laughs> as I like to call them. Um, and, but there are the, the teams of volunteers down there as well. And we communicate and share results and data collection um, too. So they're, they're mostly managed by Fish and Wildlife Service, but they're not a formal monitoring program because they're not in the snowy plover management area. Yeah, you mentioned like a snowy plover nest at seaside and if they come back and start to congregate there, do you have the ability to designate that as a snowy plover site? Or yeah, good question. Um, that's a long, it's a, it's a multi-year process to designate a snowy plover management area. And it is a possibility, and certainly if they stay there. Um, that site is so highly dynamic that it's plovers have nested before on the Gerhart side of that inlet as well, which is a better spot for them because it's a bit more isolated. And it, the, the river will just change the site every year. So just because something happened this year doesn't mean it'll be a great spot next year at that particular area because the inlet's so small. So I'll be really curious to see what happens next year. This is the first year that we had nesting in Hempster and we actually had that one that had the chick with the dogs <laughs> that was that day. Um, that male fledged two, both chicks. They had two eggs and both of the chicks fledged. So really incredible. I was not expecting it to do well at all in that site. Um, but we had three total nests there and lots of birds that were hanging out and are interested and we're recording lots during the fall and winter right now. Like somebody just recorded 25 or something from that site. So that, that means that it might be uh, an area next year with a lot of plovers, and then we'll start that discussion if we keep seeing that happen, um, uh, start the kind of argument to make it a snowy plover management area, but I'm not sure how that will go. Yeah. Does it require a uh, park ranger assignment? There, there is a park, so park rangers are assigned geographically across like an entire stretch of beach. Um, and so there is a park ranger there that goes out and puts up the, the ropes and the fencing and things like that as well. It requires a change to what's called the federal recovery plan for snowy plovers, which is that um, intensive, like doc, very, it's like 200 page document that lays out all of the recreation restrictions and rules and how specifically it's, it's done. Um, to create a snowy plover management area. And there's uh, yeah, timeframes, multi-year timeframes, so you can propose a new site or delete a site that hasn't seen any plovers. So I think that that would be the next step if, if plovers came back and started doing that would be to add it to there. So yeah, nothing immediately, but they will get those added protections of those rope barriers and we will continue to have volunteers out to find the nest and be able to put them up. <laughs> so, and talk to people, it's a good education. Um, opportunity to talk to people out there at the beach as well. Yeah. Do other migratory birds like terns, do they, um, are there predatory towards the eggs or anything like that? Terns are, are not, they have not been recorded even with where they really closely coexist with plovers on the east coast uh, with piping plovers. Um, there's lots of terns that are nesting directly on the sand with them. And they're not recorded um, messing with plovers. Uh, incidentally, on the East Coast, American oyster catchers are egg predators on piping plovers <laughs> occasionally and chick predators. Um, so yeah, some other birds can, but mostly here our main avian issues are with um, frozen ravens as well as harriers are the big ones. And gulls sometimes, but not often. 
You, you talked briefly about the restoration area to the edge. I know that, I mean, Halo Bay is completely messed up. But um, is it possible to do any restoration? Yeah, so the Halen Bay has a restoration area, actually. There is a, um, and I don't have aerial imagery of it, but there's a big kind of football field size section um, of dune that's been cut out for snowy plovers in that area. And they continue to do um, added maintenance work every year to keep it up. So that was done about three years ago. Um, yeah, so that that has its own issues like with predators and things like that on that site, I think. Um, so the, the plovers do like that restoration area and they try to nest there, but they don't have much success on that restoration area. Yeah. Yeah, I've been to Ledbetter a bunch up in Long Beach Minnesota. They've yeah. done a lot of that in school. They have the pink sand verbena all going yeah. up there and stuff. It's so yeah. beautiful. But um, they have the driving on the beach and the right. data will actually put T posts all the way down the beach to stop the cars. And I was thinking, you know, we have a lot of, um, bicycles on it. Mm -hmm. We do. And we don't do that, right? We don't have the T-posts like really stopping people. We don't. And they've, they've tried um, doing that. And it's something about the way the currents are. They just rip anything out immediately. They're actually experimenting with putting next year. We were just talking about this. They're putting out um, potentially like a kind of a buoy system uh, that will that will have like a buoy that's out in the lower tide line so people will have to go around it in order to see it so sort of similar um system but that is a big issue exactly right it's bikes because the tidal difference between where the plover area is and the low tide is so significant um that people don't even see the fencing area they don't know they're violating the rules until they're halfway down they're like what do you mean way up there you can't so it's it can be a challenge at that site yeah we're experimenting with different ways to try to do it yeah are there any uh, plovers actually known in Clatsop County? Yeah, uh, any like any are nesting in Clatsop County? Yeah, so Columbia River area is our best site for them. So we had um, 15 nests there this year on the on the Clatsop Spit on the Columbia Strike, right, right by the jetty where they're doing all that construction. So there are more places with active doom movement yeah. rather than the open ocean or open shore. Exactly. They they really like um, that area with with, with lots of lower dunes like that area has really great lower dunes has a lot of verbena up there and things like that too which attracts lots of bugs that they eat you always see them around there um and so yeah that that they really like that site next to the river they really love river inlets so that's a great site for them yeah you said that the, they eat sand fleas well actually sand fleas are amphipods not exactly. insects. yeah yeah and so you confused me on that one. Oh yeah sorry <laughs> Yes, they eat insects back in the lower dune lines and also amphipods, right? So sand fleas um, are their one of their favorite food items, but they'll also hang out, particularly when they have chicks, they might hang out all day in the back dune grasses so they can hide more from predators during the day. Yeah, great point. Not not actual insects. What's the maximum number of eggs that you've seen a female lay? I mean, it sounds like she's just kind of an egg laying machine. That's yeah, right. So they, they can do up to five ish nest attempts per year. And so, you know, it depends on whether they were successful or not, but that's a lot of eggs that they produce. And so the later clutches. Um, you know, the ones that are laid later in the season might sometimes not have a full clutch of three eggs. You might lay like one or two. <laughs> and starting for July time frame, you might see smaller clutches of eggs because that's that's a lot of eggs produced per year. So might even be more than that. And we do have one question online so far asking, um, just uh, reminding where the female goes. So the female, um, she will hang out on the nests and she, they'll, they'll stick around. So the males and females will kind of hang out together during the breeding season. And she's usually incubating during the day and he's incubating at night. And then when they hatch, she'll go find another male that doesn't have a, a, a mate at that moment and, um, and nest with them for the, uh, a second nest attempt after the young hatch. So mating is, is spur of the moment and that's it then. yeah kind of i mean they do once they do lay eggs together then they'll stick around so they'll share incubation duties but then once it hatches the females out and we'll find somebody else yeah monogamy for 35 days yeah. <laughs> well, it works it works yeah it works for them do do the chicks come back to the same place to nest or having been able to follow that yeah that's um they will and they won't so they'll they'll come back maybe not necessarily the exact same place. It's more based on how many plover pairs are already out of sight and the young ones can't really compete often. And so they'll have to find a subpar place to nest and then they might return later on in life. And we do know 
that they they sometimes will return to that same place, but they often will find a, a new site nearby and they'll go back to that site year after year. So it's not necessarily their natal site, but they are what's called site fidelic and they'll return to the same places year after year to try it. Yeah. So what are you doing on this project this time of year? Besides oh, the yeah. elections. Data, yeah. <laughs> Lots of um oh, I just spent the last few months. We um write annual reports every year, um, both for the state as well as the federal government because they're governed by that endangered species act. So we write reports for the state, we write reports for the federal government, we write reports for our funders. Um, very generously uh, funded on this program for Portland Audubon, um, and I give presentations, and then I help think of ways to make next year even better. So we're trying to improve our data collection app and find different ways um, to make it better, improve our trainings and things like so that. Are these published papers or in-house reports? Or uh, mostly in-house reports, so we do post them both on our website, and they're also publicly available on you know the, the various repositories and the government ones as well. We're also working on a published paper related to how um, birds will come, uh, basically banded birds and how they're returning to the Oregon coast and recolonizing it. So all three um, also go and give talks at scientific conferences about it as well. So kind of all, all of the above, much less each time in the winter. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to go off topic for a minute. Sure. And black oyster catchers, could you give yes, us a thank brief you. update? Yeah, thank you for the reminder. Like? Yeah, so um, another role beyond the Clover program is also working with our black oyster catcher and seabird monitoring programs as well, um, which we worked with Nadia on the seabird monitoring program for several years. Um, our black oyster catcher project is similar uh, in some ways in which we monitor nests all across the Oregon coast um, as well. And this year we had about 70 monitored nests and we're still working on the data um, throughout the Oregon coast. Uh, but that's another community science program that you can get involved with, which is on the same page if you're interested in monitoring and following black oyster catchers. So our uh, ATRAP folks submit data for our haystack rock nests too. So in this area, we're also seeing increasing numbers of black oyster catchers in the North Coast too, which is awesome. Yeah, they're my favorite too. <laughs> Thank you. So we have another online question asking, um, what does the courtship look like? Yeah, good question. It's it's hard to find. Actually, one of the my favorite things about um, finding courtship evidence is uh, they do something called tattooing. And so that's when they take both of their feet, the male will, and he'll stamp on the ground like this. And so their tracks look different where they're normally like this. Instead, they're all overlapping on top of each other like a dance. And so you see these tattooing tracks and it's the male basically stamping around on um, for the female and then he'll dig her a bunch of different nests and things like that too. And there's some calling that goes on um, as well. So he'll do some vocalizations that, that stamping march tattooing thing. Um, and then he'll dig her multiple scrapes before she selects one to nest in. Or walks away. Sometimes that happens. Too. <laughs> so it's really hard to capture to like actually be able to see it. I've only seen it myself a few times, so it's pretty cool. Allison, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, really. really um, and so, just a reminder: if folks want to participate or help out or go to the intensive training, the information is available on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, please it do. Starts soon, like February. It starts soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, March. We do trainings in in March and April. Yeah, yeah. So it starts soon, and it's a good opportunity to do it. And even if you don't, we also do public clover patrol walks, so people can kind of get just a a taste of what it's like um, to be out there and be able to see some of these these birds themselves. So that's also on our Portland Audubon website. We post it there as well. And those typically occur in like May and June when it's the height of the clover monitoring season. So you have the best chance of seeing nests and chicks and things like that too. Several years ago, I helped with the uh, Sanderling surveys. Nice. I was told to look at high tide because that was a time when they weren't likely to be any around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any any Sanderlings around or any snowy clovers? Well, around? The, the theory was that the Sanderlings would uh, would go to particular beaches and not be spread up. That's true. The the, yeah. the, the length of the county, so that that. That's fair. Anyway, That's a good it's strap. simple for me. I just yeah. stopped a few places and two looked with my binoculars, didn't see any birds. So I said, well, oh, I don't have to identify a sanderling. If there's no yeah. bird, there's no sanderling. I mean, fair point. Yeah. But sanderlings, I'd almost want to go at low tide because you can always see them. <laughs> I didn't know the ways, but I see the point. 